Yes, the B-movies were right all along. Alien species really are conquering the planet. They are not from outer space, but from our own world. And they are costing the global economy over a trillion dollars, more than climate change. In this edition of Nature Inc., we identify some of the invaders committing what some see as eco-terrorism on a planetary scale, on our seas, agriculture and wildlife. Be prepared to be afraid, very afraid. For 200 years, the free market has dominated global economic thinking, but it left something vital off the books, the services nature provides to the whole human race. In 2003, scientists valued those services at $33 trillion a year. Nature Inc. asks what would happen if governments and big business had to pay for what nature provides us for free. A recently captured snake awaits biologists at the Everglades National Park in Florida, USA. It's a Burmese python. It's 10,000 kilometers from home, and it's wreaking havoc. In January 2003, we had the first of what would then be several alligator python incidents. Where an alligator and a python got together and they grappled. Hundreds of people saw it, took pictures, took video. That was an, clearly a big event and enough interest to say, what is this giant snake doing in, in the Everglades? So how on earth does a Burmese python get to Florida? The answer is Miami, the tropical gateway to America, where there is a market for every desire, from the most outrageous of pastimes to the most exotic of pets. The cheapest thing you could get was a Burmese python when you went into a pet store. Uh, you know, parents would go in with a kid and the little boy wants a snake. And mother's thinking, well, I don't want to spend very much, so there's a $30 snake, Burmese python. They didn't tell him at the pet store that the thing was going to get over 20 feet long. They didn't know. But the kid kept it long enough till it kept getting bigger and bigger, and I'm sure it wasn't in a good cage. So when it scared the heck out of the mother, she said, Get rid of it. What do you think he did? <laughs> he just let it go. Regulation of the exotic pet trade is getting stricter. But for the python, it's too little, too late. Because 150,000 have already been imported into the US in the past five years. Last year, control efforts cost the taxpayer over a quarter of a million dollars. Because when the pythons escape, they breed rapidly. And in this new habitat, become a form of biological pollution. Unlike oil pollution, it's the gift that keeps on giving because they're biological and the biological imperative is to figure out how to produce, whereas oil doesn't do that. So now we, we've got a self-perpetuating spill. Pythons have already slithered their way south to the Florida Keys, the tourists' favorite destination. The python would have a nice niche here um, with really very little to predate it. In the Keys, the pythons are enjoying a brand new menu of rare delicacies, rare because they are highly endangered. According to the Nature Conservancy, invasives like the pythons are contributing to the decline of 40% of endangered and threatened species in the US, such as these wood rats and muskrats. Last year, the US Geological Survey published a map showing the potential spread of the pythons. The probable area of expansion is marked in green. And it's not just pythons. Thousands of invasive species of all kinds are taking over the US, costing the US economy an estimated $120 billion every year. Only when a species has demonstrated to us that it's harmful, it's already spread, it's already killed some people or killed some wildlife or killed some agricultural crops, only then do we say, well, this was a bad idea, we wish we hadn't done that, but we can't do anything about it now. We're just going to either tolerate it, or maybe we're going to have to spend millions of dollars trying to keep it under control. 
Some of the most dangerous alien species appear harmless. After all, how much damage can a simple mollusk do? In 1959, the Great Lakes in Michigan were connected to the Atlantic Ocean by a canal. It created a key route for trade in and out of North America's industrial heartland. But it also provided a route in for the invaders. Between 1959 and 2006, there were approximately a um, little bit over 80 new aquatic non-native non species discovered, of which about 65% are attributed to ballast water. Ballast water used by ships to increase stability is the perfect hiding place for stowaways. When it takes in water, it takes in whatever is in the water. All the animals, mud, silt, uh, eggs of the, of, the little, of the aquatic organisms, it, all that stuff comes in. Well, that ballast water, if it came from Otter Dam, is also discharging the animals. It's discharging them into the Great Lakes, and that's basically how these species are getting in here. In the 1980s, ballast carrying zebra mussels from the Black Sea was released into the Great Lakes. Nothing would ever be the same again. Because of the way it reproduces, because it's so prolific, and because it's what you would call a fouling organism, that is, it attaches to hard surfaces like, like barnacles, most freshwater systems have not seen fouling organisms. When the zebra mussel invaded the Great Lakes, it was an entirely new situation for a human society. Now Great Lake cities such as Chicago and Detroit are paying dearly for the failure to stop ships emptying their ballast. Anything that uses cooling water that's drawing it in from the Great Lakes has now had to adapt to the fact that if they don't do something the zebra mussels are simply going to clog their pipes. All that costs money. That money presumably is going to be passed on to the consumer so it increases the cost of doing business. The U.S. government estimates the annual cost of trying to cope with the fouling caused by the zebra mussel will be $500 million a year. But that's the direct cost. It takes no account of the devastating impact on the lake's food chain. For instance, the mussels are out competing a native shrimp called diapurea. No one is more aware of the changes to the lake's ecology than the fishermen who are seeing their profits disappear. The, um Diapariya were a very high in lipid content little animal. These were like um, like a Snickers bar. So whitefish eating these Snickers bars had a very rapid growth rate. We would see fish go to maturity in maybe 17, 18 months. Now these same whitefish are taking five and six years to reach a maturity based on the fact that the food web's changed. A local fishery research center estimates the whitefish catch has declined by over 35% in seven years. At one point, there were 3,500 commercial fishing licenses in the state of Michigan. Today, I think I can guess that we're down to probably 20 larger operations like ourselves and our neighbors that have survived. The International Maritime Organization, a specialized UN agency, is trying to regulate where ships empty their ballast water but it's difficult to control a rogue captain emptying his tanks and even harder to control animal smugglers. An international coalition of scientists, the Global Invasive Species Program, estimates that alien species cost the world economy $1.4 trillion a year. It's not that the costs aren't high now, it's just that all of society is paying them. So perhaps a more rational approach would be to make those costs internalized by the industries that are causing those effects. And of course the hope in doing that would be that there would be new and more efficient practices discovered to prevent those introductions in the first place. Coming up in part two, the seeds of despair costing Pampas ranchers millions of dollars a year and why Nifty has been recruited to help in the battle against a voracious amphibian. Guatambu Farm in southern Brazil, on the border with Argentina. This is cattle country. Walter Peter's family has built one of the most successful ranches in the state of Rio Grande do Sul, where rich grasslands help support a $6 billion export industry.
But now an invader is threatening to end decades of hard work. Every morning the farm's workforce starts battle with the new arrival. This is the plant I want to control and the good grass I need to keep. You see, it's hard to pull out. That is why it wears the teeth of cattle. It's full of fiber. In two or three years, an animal living of this will have no teeth left. On top of that, it has no nutritional value. The cattle don't earn any weight. The ranchers hate African love grass. It was brought to Brazil in the 1950s by a farmer impressed by its fast growth. It's known in Brazil by his name, Capim Anoni, a reminder that the road to ecological hell is paved with good intentions. 